It's coming soon. I feel the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's going to be good. Um, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10. Our topic today is when God kills. When God kills. A fantastic one. Leviticus, of course, written by Moses. Um, it's compiled at Mount Sinai. The audience of the Israelites, they just, they just come out of Egypt. They're slaves. And um, God first gives them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. He gives them the tabernacle. They build it. And then he starts to show them how the priests must work in the tabernacle. So what we're actually about to witness in chapter 10 is in chapter 7 and 8, there was an ordination service that lasted seven days. And on the eighth day, on the first day of ministry, this gentleman decided to do something um, outside of God's command and they died on their first day. They've just been ordained into ministry and on their first day they die. So let's turn to uh, Leviticus 10. It says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, on the fire, and then offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went from the Lord, the fire came from God, and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, and this is the key verse, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. This is God commanding us to understand the holiness of God. So even our word for the year is important. Study any book you can get on the holiness of God. Not, the holy, not our holiness, the holiness of God. Get your hands on it and study it. Father, help us today to express your word. Help us, Father, to reveal the power of Jesus Christ in all scriptures. Father, I pray, Lord, let the gospel break through in this room. Father, I pray for the hearts of our children the hearts of every man, every woman that increase our love for you. In this word, Father, may we have a greater respect and a greater honor for your holiness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. This is the word of the Lord. My Bible talk today is the wrath of God. The wrath of God. I'm going to give you some definitions and then my definition and some perspectives about the wrath of God. Uh, the first definition I'm going to give out is from Miriam Webster in terms of what the word wrath means. The Webster Dictionary says, wrath uh, pertains to strong anger or indignation or retributory punishment for an offense or a crime. The other definition is divine chastisement. That's English. When you must tell your children, I will chastise you. Number two, John Stott, an incredible, incredible mind, said the wrath of God is God's steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all its forms and manifestations. And this is a very good definition because of two words, steady, that God's wrath is steady. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not impulsive. Number two, uncompromising. In that, when God releases his wrath, it's without fear and without favor. Number three, Schrock says, The wrath of God is the holy action of re retributive justice towards persons whose actions deserve eternal condemnation. I think uh, this definition by Schrock um, has the right idea of retributive justice, that there's an aspect of God's wrath that uh, pertains to retributive justice, but I think it falls short when it just uh, focuses on eternal condemnation because God's wrath is not only aimed towards an eschatological outcome. It's not just about eternal condemnation. It is revealed 
and deals with various aspects of evil, injustice, and sin in the earth. Number four, Jared said, there is really no good way to soften the wrath of God to mean anything than an angry response on God's part to human disobedience. I like his definition here uh, because there's actually no soft way. There's no way to soften the wrath of God. And many times in the modern day church, we, we only talk about the love of God, the grace of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God. And we try and soften the, the wrath of God, the aspect of the wrath of God. Uh, but when he says it's an angry response, in a way I have to push back a bit because he's putting it sort of um, within the category of human, uh, of human emotion. And when we're dealing with the wrath of God, we have to be very careful not to equate it to our anger. Because it's, it's, it's another kind of wrath. It's not like our... Uh, our anger, you know, like for those who are parents, you know, that anger sometimes children can raise up in your heart. It's not like that. Um, it's in a category by itself. Number five, Sproul said the wrath of God is his holy hatred towards sin. This is a good definition. It's very minimalistic. And what I like about it is it highlights, it highlights the holiness of God and his hatred for sin. And part of sanctification is sanctification increases your love for God. At the same time, it increases your hatred for your sin. Whatever sin you are entertaining, the more you spend time in the Spirit of God, in the presence of God, you start to hate sin and start to love God. Uh, number six, uh, A.W. Tozer said, The wrath of God is his eternal detestation. You know, these British theologians are amazing. Of all unrighteousness, it is the displeasure and indignation of divine righteousness against evil. I like this definition because he's now using like legal language. Whenever you see righteousness, righteousness in the Bible is actually a legal term. And unrighteous means you're breaking the law of God. And he shows us that the battle, God's wrath is at war with unrighteousness. It's at war with unrighteousness. So if you are living in righteousness, you've got nothing to fear. But if you are rebelling, you've got something to fear. Yeah. Number seven, D.A. Carson, one of my favorite theologians, says, God's wrath in the Bible is not an emotion pulsating through the divine veins of God. Right? It is settled opposition against sin. It is settled. It's constant. It's like... It's like um, for those with electric fences, it's like a constant, it, it doesn't go up or down. It's a constant 10,000 kilowatts. It's constant. It's settled. And this is a strong definition because he clearly eliminates any idea that God's wrath is equated to our fallen emotions as man. And it helps us understand the wrath of God as being settled. And it's a settled opposition against sin and evil. So it shows that God's wrath is not something out of control. It's not something wild. It's not something, it's not something that is outside of his control. It is very controlled and very measured within himself. And then Monet's favorite uh, preacher, Charles Spurgeon, said, The wrath of God is not a temporary passion. It is the holiness of God stirred up against sinful activity. And Spurgeon here focuses on the activity of the wrath of God. Now, my definition, number nine, of the wrath of God is the wrath of God is the infinitely perfect response within the righteous character of God in opposition to sin and evil. His wrath is the perfect response, infinitely perfect response, infinitely perfect response to anything sinful or evil in his creation. It's not a human outburst of anger, but it's a deep-seated, perfect response to the violation of his holiness. Yeah. And it's an infinitely perfect response to the perversion of his divine design and order. God's wrath always expresses the seriousness of his holiness. The holiness of God is serious. And it also expresses the seriousness 
of sin in the sight of God. Amen. The target of God's wrath is always sin. Yeah. Number 10. So let's look at some perspectives around this. Let, let's keep refining this thing. So what is the nature of God's wrath? It is not human anger. It is holy wrath. So what that means, it's a wrath that is infinitely perfect and infinitely moral and infinitely just and infinitely fair. So anytime you see the wrath of God in the Bible, just know it's the perfect time for it. It's the right action. And it's the most fair and most just, uh, uh, the most just judgment they can be. Yeah. Number 11, the wrath of God is very precise. It has sniper precision. It's always perfect. It hits the target. When God shoots to kill, he doesn't miss. They are never innocent bystanders that are caught in the wrath of God. He gets the right person he's meant to get. Number 12. The justice of God's wrath is always perfect justice. There has never been a miscarriage of justice in the courtroom of God. No criminals get away. And no innocents get punished in God's courtroom. Number 13. The wrath of God is not in conflict with the love of God. God being loving doesn't stop him from expressing his wrath. God expressing his wrath is actually showing how loving he is. So for example, if, uh, you, if criminals came to your house and they were trying to attack your wife and children, if you just said, ah, I love you guys, I love you criminals, I'm just a loving guy, and then they rob, they beat up your wife and kids, when, your wife say, when you tell your wife you love her, she'll say, you don't love me. I didn't see you express your wrath. When evil came in the home. For God to be angry, it shows his loving. For him to hate sin and evil, it shows his love even more. Number 14, God's wrath is good. <laughs> God opposing sin and evil reveals the glory of his goodness. The goodness of God is revealed in the wrath of God. Are you hearing me here? Give God praise right there. So it was very important for us to establish um, some doctrinal foundations pertaining to the wrath of God as we look at this subject when God kills, particularly in the Leviticus 10. Because we're going to see the wrath of God on full display against two individuals, Nadab and Abihu, who we see in verse 2, they got killed by God. And whenever we come across the wrath of God in the Bible, um, as we can see on display in Leviticus 10, we have to be very careful because our fallen sin nature has a tendency of re re reacting flippantly to the wrath of God. Many times in our sinfulness, in our fallenness, we end up putting God on trial. When God acts in wrath, we don't put the, the people who he has acted against on trial no we put god on trial and we start questioning his goodness we question his love we question his holiness and ultimately we question his sovereignty and when we enter this text and we look at the burnt corpses of nadab and abihu and the smoke coming from their bodies in the holy place in the tabernacle something in us is going to start questioning god's goodness his love his holiness and sovereignty to his goodness, we will question and wrestle with the paradox of how a good God could decree such a fate upon his own servants. Yeah. How can a good God kill and still be considered good? Yeah. To his love, we will find ourselves trying to reconcile our modern day church picture of a loving God who's been presented on TBN, on every book. On social media, we're just told that God is love, God is caring, God He's a good, good Father. That's all, we, that's all He is. And when we look at this text, we're going to look at God and it seems very harsh and even barbaric. And we start to think this Old Testament God is evil. Why is He burning these two men to death? And we'll ask, how can a loving God who claims to be love 
still kill and still be considered love. And to his holiness will ask, how can a holy God kill and remain holy straight after killing? Then finally to his sovereignty, yes, and that is where our fallen nature rears its ugly head. We will find ourselves asking ourselves, what entitles God anyway to wield the power of life and death over everybody? What gives God the right to kill? Recently, there was a pastor actually questioning God. I saw him on TikTok, questioning why did God kill? If I, if I had my God, didn't have to kill. And these are complex questions in the Bible. And um, the tensions um, show us that the wrath of God is a complex subject. And the idea of God's direct anger resulting in the death of individuals in the case of Nadab and Abihu is one that is challenging to all of us no matter how mature you are as a believer. And it is within these tensions that are in the Bible uh, that our faith in Jesus Christ is tested and strengthened. Simply because as we seek to reconcile the wrath of God and the grace of God in this text, it's important that we mustn't be like most modern day Christians who only focus on the grace of God and we censor and hide anything to do with the wrath of God in the Bible. So we don't find ourselves able to deal with suffering. We don't find ourselves able to deal with pain. We don't find ourselves able to deal with adversity. We struggle to deal when doors are being closed. We struggle to deal with the tensions and the hard moments of life because in our mind we thought that He is only good. You know, this morning before church, I answered a question uh, Kanye West asked on, on TikTok. Uh, he said, why should we fear God anyway? Isn't he supposed to be love? Why must we fear him? I don't like that part about God. And that's why I'm no more a Christian, because why must he be feared? He must just be loved. And I was like, hey, if you spend less time making beats and reading the Bible, you might understand that God is not just one attribute. There are many attributes in God, and they are not in conflict. They are not in opposition. His love, His kindness, His wrath, all these attributes are a part of what make God, God. And ultimately, it is not our job to manage God. It's our job to submit to God. Our job is not to put Him in the box which we are comfortable with. Our job is to humble ourselves and say, you are other, you are holy, and trust that he is good, trust that he is love, trust that he is gracious. Are you hearing me here? Because this idea of God killing people gets very offensive to many of us in this postmodern age. Both the saved and the unsaved get comfortable with the killing God. There are some saved people who even argue that God doesn't kill and has never killed. I've got a pastor friend who argues that God never kills. They are deeply mistaken. God in the Bible both directly and indirectly killed many people. In fact, there is an atheist who made it their job to, to study God's body count of how many people he's killed. He's got a be beautiful website where he documents everyone. He even estimated that in the flood, 20 million people perished in one day. Though the Bible doesn't give us a number, they estimated with their Scientology. There's many people God, but he's right. There are many people God has killed in the Bible. And uh, sometimes directly and indirectly. And you see it in the flood in Genesis 6, Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19. Lord's wife, Genesis 19, that's on God. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, that was God. Genesis 38, Onan, the secondborn of uh, Judah, he was killed for weird bedroom activities. The Egyptians, during the Exodus, and of course the children of Israel, they saw God killing the Egyptians. And then even when they came out, when they made that, uh, that uh, golden calf, God killed some of them on that day. Are you hearing me here? The wrath of God has manifested in the Bible through God killing people. And in this text, 
two men have been killed by the fire of God. Why? Why have they been killed? So our pericope is going to look to answer this. It's just three verses. Uh, verse 1, profane fire. Verse 2, holy fire. Verse 3, holy God. So let's look at verse 1, which is uh, the profane fire section. And uh, here, there's only one question that we have to ask. It is, what is profane fire? Strange fire. That they offered to God that got them killed. Because in verse 2 it says, in verse 1 it says, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer, put fire in it. There's two movements. Put fire in it, then put incense on it, on the fire, and offered profane fire before the Lord which he had not commanded them. So in the censer, and to understand what a censer is, um, you've got to imagine like a, a metal bowl kind of uh, utensil. So in it, they would open, and then they would put coal. Then on that coal, they would put incense and enter the holy place and start to release smoke in the room. All right. So in the text, uh, we can see that the problem is, with, is not with the incense they used, um, but the, the problem is with the fire. And the question becomes, what fire were they actually meant to use? So that's the first question. The text doesn't tell us which fire they used, but the Bible tells us what fire they must use. When you go to Exodus 30 verse 9, you will find clear instructions regarding the incense. And later on in Leviticus 16, we shall see that the fire that is meant to be used in the, in the tabernacle is coals that are taken from the bronze altar. The fire they were meant to use was from the coals from the bronze altar. Why? Those coals were drenched with the blood of a substitutionary atoning sacrifice. And this is the running theme of Leviticus. It's for us as fallen men to know that we don't approach God, a holy God, in our capacity as fallen men. Simply because our sin invites the wrath of God upon us and we die. God is approached through putting faith in the sacrificial death of a substitute. The fire was strange because it didn't have the blood of a substitute. When you show up in the presence of God... You must put your faith in a substitute as he has commanded or you will be insulting the holiness of God yeah. and the holiness of God will never be disrespected. Yeah. It will never be disrespected by sin. It will strike out and deal with it. These men were well trained for this. In chapters 8 to 9, they had been through an elaborate ordination ceremony it lasted seven days, and on the eighth day, this was their first time serving in the presence of God. And they decided to worship God on their own terms and enter the presence without a fire that didn't have the blood of a substitute, which was an act of rebellion and pride of putting trust in human flesh and human goodness. That's not good enough to approach a holy God. And they got killed on the spot by the fire of God. What can we learn from this? Number one, worship must be God-centered, not man-centered. We must worship God according to His terms, not our feelings. Modern day worship is feelings and vibes based. But it's not, the feelings and the vibes are not as important as what the worship is saying. What is the most important part of a worship song? Is it the beat? Is it the genre? Is it the chords? All of that is icing. The most important thing about a worship song is the content. What is this song saying? Is it strengthening our biblical knowledge and faith in God? Is it edifying the substitute who makes it possible for me to approach God without fear of being killed. Are you hearing me here? We have to make sure that when we are worshipping, we are increasing our knowledge of who, the holiness of God and the power of the substitute 
Jesus Christ who allows me to approach the holiness of God. I can't approach with strange fire. Our worship can't just be songs about me. I'm going to another level. I'm, I'm making money. Everything is doubling. Strange fire. There's nothing about the substitute on that coal. The blood must be on the fire. That's driving your worship. We must, we must see the substitute when we are worshiping. One of the most powerful songs I heard recently was from Mabongi. And one of the, the, the lyrics they said is, You could have let 10,000 angels come to your rescue, but instead you endured 10,000 insults in order to die in my place. That's the fire of a substitute in worship. Captured in worship. If we're not capturing the substitutionary atonement in worship, what are we doing? Yeah. What are we singing? Yeah. In the modern day church, we come to sing about ourselves and hear the preacher preach about ourselves and we go home excited about ourselves. But we haven't seen the bigness of who God is in the worship and in the sermon. Number two, our attitude when it comes to worship cannot be laid back. It's got to be intense. We need to approach God with reverence and deep respect where we recognize His value and honor Him in worship. Worship has become very playful in our time. It's become very relaxed. We have to come in the presence of God and fear God, Kanye West, when we are worshiping Him. And thirdly, we can't be sloppy in how we worship and in how we serve. Because what we are doing as a church has generational importance. We must take it seriously and always do whatever we're called to do in the house of God on a high level. Are you hearing me here? We must always value every person who comes to church. We must understand that we have got a responsibility from heaven. To reveal Christ. And we have to do it on a high level. Let's go to holy fire, verse 2. And we'll see that they got killed by fire which comes from a holy God. It was holy fire. God's response to their sin in His presence was a holy response. In other words, it was an infinitely perfect response. There was no sin no evil in what God chose to do to them. Are you hearing me here? Amen. The last time they had seen the fire of God was actually in Le Leviticus 9.24, after the ordination process. God blessed the ordination. They put offerings, burnt offerings um, on the altar, and God actually sent that same fire which killed them, went to the altar and dealt with the substitute. Are you hearing me here? It, it burnt the offerings and it, everybody was excited. It took seven days. You know why it took seven days? It was a picture of Genesis. God had left the garden, but he was coming back to the tabernacle to live amongst men. It was a recreation again. And God was coming to live among them. And it was a time of rejoicing. So the fire came and burnt the substitute. Because in God's eye, the fire is not meant to burn you. It's meant to burn the substitute. The holy fire of God was not meant to burn them. It was meant to burn the substitute. But they chose to come in with the fire of man and not the fire of a substitute. And they got consumed by the holy fire. Because they said, let me stand in my flesh. You cannot overcome what you're overcoming in the flesh. You cannot overcome the powers of darkness in your own strength. You cannot overcome temptation. You cannot overcome the situations in your life in your own strength. You have to depend on that man, the crucified one, Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me here? So at this point, I have to indicate to you, every time that God's wrath has been released in the Bible, 
and in history against anyone, it was well deserved. God within himself has settled in himself to always oppose evil and deal with sin with uncompromising righteousness. These two men deserved what happened to them. Anytime we see his wrath at work against sin and sinners, it's the right action of a holy God. He was so right. You know what he even told to Aaron? Aaron was not even allowed to see them. It was his cousins. His own brothers didn't bury him. His cousins, they were not even buried. They were thrown on a heap where other corpses of animals get burnt. Aaron was not allowed to cry was not allowed to tear his garment. He was told the same day, come into the temple and serve. There was no funeral. Because what I have done is perfect. It's the holy and right thing that they deserved. And you now have a choice to align with me or to align with your rebellious sons. And Aaron chose to align with God. Because priests were not allowed to go near dead things. They had to, because God is not a God of death. He's a God of life. Amen. And he, they were not allowed to even go near anything dead. Because they were ministering the things of life. How can you learn to trust God? Even when he is going against something you like. You need to grow to that place where you trust God's divine actions because he is a holy God. God is not trigger happy. The Bible shows us that he is very patient with us. A motif in the Bible is God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. So when he does strike quickly, know that something has happened. Something serious has happened in violation of the perfection of God. And God has to deal with it immediately. When Adam fell, he didn't come in and kill him. He gave him time. When Cain killed Abel, do you know that God marked him and protected him till he died? He was very successful in his life. God consistently is a God of grace. Noah preached for many days. They don't tell you that part. Come to the ark. A flood is coming. He, for many days, but they're quick to say, God killed. They refused to come. They refused to come. God never acts in wrath like we act. And when he does, know that they deserved it. Yeah. Know that song, you deserve it. That's what you should sing for these guys. <laughs> Satan himself is still walking in the earth. God is slow to anger. His time is coming. Are you hearing me here? God is a God of patience. And the problem is worldly people, they think God's patience is an endorsement of their sin. But there's a time where God pulls the trigger. And when God pulls the trigger, he doesn't miss. Are you hearing me here? So anytime you see God's wrath in the Bible, I would like to argue that anyone killed by God in the Bible was not an innocent puppy. They deserved it. The wrath of God goes where it deserves to go. Likewise, anytime you see the grace of God, the blessing of God, the favor of God, or elevation to anyone in the Bible, it's always unmerited and undeserved. It's always by grace. We mess up when we keep trying to find formulas from the Old Testament of how to compel God to bless us. Yet He simply calls us to put our faith and our trust in the sacrifice of a substitute, Jesus Christ. Because your blessings are by grace, through the substitute, through the blood of a substitute, you have access to the blessing of God. Amen. There is no formula. There are no 10 steps to increase. There are no 4,000 keys to elevation. Amen. It's just trust in the substitute, Amen. that it is by grace. By grace, he will bless me. By grace, he will open this door for me. By grace, you will elevate me. I don't need no formulas. I don't need a different way of prayer, a different way of... I just need to have faith in the power of the blood of the substitute. 
and trust that his goodness will open the door that I need. Amen. And then let's close with verse 3, holy God. So after Nadab and Abihu are dead, Moses comes in and says this on behalf of God. By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. This is what God is saying. Those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all people, I must be glorified. We didn't tell Kanye about the holiness of God. We told him about the blessing. And I pray we're not making the same mistake with Casper and Black Coffee. That we mustn't just say, you are blessed, you are blessed. God is holy, Casper. You have to repent. You have to live right. You have to live a holy life. This Christian life is not pop and place. It's a life of submission. Self-denial. A life of sacrificing for others. A life of humility. It's not a life of being flashy. Thank God for your may back. But you don't need to rub it in people's faces anymore. This is a new life. It's not the continuation of your old life. Are you hearing me here? Moses in this text is speaking to the remaining priests and the children of Israel that to approach God. The first thing on your mind must be the holiness of God. If there's anything this story is showing us is the seriousness of the holiness of God. Chandler said, failing to know to the seriousness of God is an attempt at theft at all that is due God, end quote. When you can't see the seriousness of the holiness of God, that within God there is an uncompromising hatred to sin. So much so that for fallen men to approach God, it had to be through the death of a substitute. Meaning that the substitute dies in our place. The substitute receives what we are meant to receive so that we can approach God. He dies the death we deserve to die because of our sin. And it's only through putting our faith in the blood of this substitute that we can approach God. In the time of Nadab and Abihu, it was the blood of burnt sacrifices. They were meant to get the coal from the altar. The, the coal which, was, which had burnt the sacrifices, where the blood of a substitute was still on the coal. And that's why God released his fire. They came into his presence with profane fire. Fire. The fire that was meant for the sacrifices. The fire that was meant for the substitute. So he says, you've rejected the substitute. So you're coming in your capacity. You're coming in your righteousness. You're coming in your goodness. Okay, so let's see if your righteousness can, can handle the fire of heaven. It failed killed them and rabbis argue that the fire was so powerful that it killed them but didn't harm the priestly garments because the garments were sanctified by the blood of a lamb are you hearing me here these brothers are a picture of jesus when jesus went on the cross jesus actually came on the cross with profane fire he brought strange fire on the cross the fire of our sins, which he bore as a substitute in our place. And on the cross, God released his fire from heaven on Jesus, his beloved son, to, to totally consume the profane fire of our sin that was placed on him. The innocent lamb of God was slain in our place, in our place as guilty sinful men. And it's on the cross where the holy fire of God's wrath, which we deserved for our sins, was unleashed upon Jesus. He took the wrath we deserved so that we could receive the grace we don't deserve. He took the strange fire of our sin on that cross so that when we enter the presence of God, we enter with the fire that is drenched in the blood of the substitute. So that we cannot be consumed in the presence of God because we're covered by the blood of a substitute. Amen. So with every difficult breath on the cross and every agonizing cry and every drop of blood that is shed on the cross, it was a testimony of the seriousness of our sin and the testimony of God's holy anger against our sin. 
So every time we look at the cross, we should see how Jesus became our substitute. And he endured the scorching flames of the full extent of the wrath of God against our sin. And then we must see that he absorbed the holy fire. But unlike Nadab and Abihu, he wasn't killed by the wrath of God. Oh, are you hearing me here? He laid down his life. After he absorbed the fire, that's when he chose to lay down his life and to pick it up again three days later. We worship because the price was paid by our substitute. He absorbed all of the fire. All of the wrath of God was absorbed in what we and Dr. Dumi call propitiation. He took it all and until it was finished, satisfied, and he laid down his life to fulfill scripture. And he picked it up after three days. Why? Why did Jesus do this? It's because of verse 3. So that by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all people, I must be glorified. Through Jesus Christ, our substitute, we are now able to approach a holy God. And the fire of heaven cannot consume us. Because we are coming with the blood of a substitute. He has absorbed all of the wrath. He's absorbed all of the torment. He's absorbed everything we deserved. And now we can approach him with total confidence. We can ask and pray for anything with total confidence. Not afraid that your weakness is going to stop the prayer being answered. Not afraid that some generational curse is going to stop your prayer being answered. You can attack the heavens and keep knocking for that job, keep knocking for that business, keep knocking for your family, keep knocking for growth and success in your life because you have access to God freely through having faith in the substitute. And the fire will not consume you. Let's stand. Where are you when it comes to worship? Is your worship man-centered today? Does your worship build up your biblical truth of what Jesus has done? In this season, get more Christ-centered in your worship. Get more Christ-centered in your worship. Understand who Jesus is when you worship. What is your attitude when it comes to serving God? Are you laid back and sloppy? Or are you intense and excellent in order to honor God? This is not the year to serve God half-heartedly. This is the year to serve God with all of your might. Any sacrifice we make for God in ministry is not a sacrifice compared to what He has done. There were two young men from Ohio. One was 21, one was 19. They were sent for a mission trip in South America, I think Peru or Brazil. And they were going to preach like in the jungle to share the gospel to a co poor community. And when they got there, the rule was, if you come into this community, you're not allowed to ever leave. One of them had a beautiful girlfriend who was planning to marry her. And they held hands and prayed and said, if we cross here, we're not even allowed to go back to America. We're going to stay in this pure community teaching them about Jesus until we die. They crossed over and went in. And when they saw their journals, one of them wrote, everything we lost in America is not even a sacrifice. Compared to what Jesus has done, we made the right decision to stay in this primitive village, no cameras, no social media, no notoriety, just teaching them about Jesus until we die. No marriage, no nothing. They gave their entire lives. Are you hearing me here? It's never a sacrifice compared to what Jesus has done. He has been our substitute. And we must be willing to give everything, everything for Him. Are you hearing me here? Father God, we thank you today that you are holy. Father, we thank you that everyone you killed in the Bible deserved it. 
We thank you, Father, that you are holy, you are good. It's not our place to question omniscience. It's not our place to question your love, your grace. We thank you, Father, that compared to all the people you let live in the Bible, countless amounts of people, countless amounts of evil people you even allow to live. And we thank you, Father, that the times that you pulled the trigger, whether it's Sodom and Gomorrah, whether it's Egypt, every time that you decided to act, whether it's the, the conquest of Canaan, Father, it was the right decision at the right time. And we thank you, Father, that increase our understanding of your ways, increase our understanding of your heart, increase our desire, Father, to grow and trust in you. Help us, Father, to be real Christians who walk in holiness, who walk in love, who walk in kindness, who walk in productivity, who walk in total confidence of who you are and what you have done. We thank you, Heavenly Father, today that by your grace, we will trust you in the hard seasons when things are not going our way, when doors are being closed. And we're wondering, Father, where are you? Father, we, we thank you, Father, that that's not the right question. We want to ask, who are you? that we may know who you are, that we're able to trust you in whatever valleys that we go in. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.